when God comes in and gives us an, an insight to see something that we're not depending upon our past experiences from. So I'm going to ask you to, th to lay aside all your past tonight and don't, don't look for anything that David says to, that you agree with or that you disagree with. Just listen with a completely open heart, open mind and a willing soul. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone here. I just, uh, I am always so honored to come and be with my brothers and sisters everywhere because it really, really feels in my heart like I'm just meeting myself wherever I go. And it's, I've been traveling around the country for about 13 years and up through Canada. And then this year, the Holy Spirit's got me uh, going, starting world travels now. So I get to go to other cultures that I don't even speak the languages. And they follow me around, translators, and translate the words. <laughs> into their languages, so my friend Resta, who's put together some of that beautiful music, she was saying to me in March when I was supposed to go down to Argentina, she said, I think there's going to be a, uh, <clears throat> a problem, and I said, a problem? What in the world? How could, we, how could there be a problem? And she said, well, I think there might be a language barrier, and I said, why would you think there would be a language barrier? And she says, well, they speak 
Spanish, David, and you speak English. <laughs> she said, I just don't know. And I said, oh, I don't think that's going to be a problem. And sure enough, when we got down there, um, before I got down there, they had organized 19 consecutive Course in Miracles gatherings, which the two facilitators thought it would be a logistical nightmare to do 19 in a row, where every all the meetings would be met and and everything. And a lot of them were in a city of 15 to 16 million people. Uh, the the transportation logistical nightmares <laughs> of getting around to all the places and everything. And it was just wonderful. I absolutely had a ball, and there was uh, two translators following me around, and often three or four in the meetings, and, and when the translators would get stuck on words, people would call out the words from the audience. <laughs> what we fear was there, uh, uh, just calling it out. And I was sharing with a, a couple groups I've done here in Los Angeles that one of the questions that was asked to me, because when I went down there, it was synchronized when the United States began dropping bombs on uh, Baghdad. And there was protest in the streets and all kinds of things going on down there. And uh, I was walking around just watching all the people and everything, and I saw these big banners across the street, and I said to one of them, what does that banner say? And they said, it says, Senior Bush, take up knitting. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, they're getting into the, the peace movement <laughs> And so I said, oh, I think I'm in the right country. And so uh, I, I was down there, and they actually did say to me, uh, one of the questions got translated to me, you know, through translators, you know, uh, what is your view on your president? And I said, oh, I have no president. And uh, the, the translator gave the answer and came back, uh, don't you understand the question? And I said, oh, no, that's not understandable. That's not an understandable question. Uh, I said, we're all children of God, and we all have a loving spirit parent, and we're all the same. Uh, we can't be fooled by the things of nationalities and countries and politics, we've got too much love in our hearts, and started sharing this, and they translated the whole answer, and all, mostly about 97% women were there, were all nodding, going, claro, 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 meaning clear, very clear, and then one of them, they translated, said, he's got it, <laughs> and everyone was laughing and joyful, and off the gathering went, but it started off with a question, uh, you know, again, this is not uh, awakening to a political stance or taking sides or, uh, you know, trying to make differences real because the ego is the one that tried to invent these ideas of differences. So I broke into a chorus of uh, John Lennon's song, Imagine, and they started singing with me in English uh, on key, and I had chills, <laughs> and we all were there, I'm like, whoa, where am I here? <laughs> Imagine there's no country, I wonder if you can, nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of man, you know. And we were all singing it together and harmonizing, and I just thought, you know, this is really what the oneness is about, when we all can just sing and, and sing together like we were all singing tonight, uh, harmonizing together uh, about the great glory of, of God and, and really with gratitude to the Christ mind for saying, here it is, this is real and true, you're one, and nothing can ever change that oneness. So I have a ball. I'm going back to Argentina in March, and um, I'm open. We've had talk of, of Germany, and there's all kinds of beautiful things opening up. And I just feel honored to go around and uh, just let the Holy Spirit speak through me, because um, it's not only speak through me, because uh, people have said, you know, it must be nice just going to course groups and course conferences and gatherings and spending your life... Uh, hugging people and smiling and everything, and I said, well, I'd miss the whole journey if I thought of it that way. Uh, most of the people I meet are in rest areas and uh, grocery stores and uh, laundromats and uh, rest, you know, all the parks and places along the way, and when you really get into the joy of this, you're just beaming. You just have people coming up to you and smiling and laughing and waitresses and waiters, you know, I mean, it's just that you feel like you're just so in love with everyone and you just, I mean, to me everyone's just a sweetie. And so I go around and I really think that and, I, and that's how it turns out. I mean, you know, just everywhere. Everyone comes out of the woodwork just so cute and adorable. Even when I went through this transformation, things like um, like biological parents, uh, you know, they went from the old perception of them was when I thought they were parents and I thought I was the son. And I had expectations of them, and they of me, and it was really all my mind. So when I let go of all that, 
Then I said, they turned into Cupid dolls. They were just so adorable. <laughs> you know, can we make you some brownies before you go and make you some cookies? <laughs> Woo! You know, it was just, you know, incredible. But it was actually incredible. It was believable because that was what forgiveness was about. You know, when you, when you take all the, the projections and the concepts that you lay on everyone and you just let go of those, then everybody is really adorable. Mm -hmm. And so I have that experience now with groups, whether it doesn't really matter. I don't even, I mean, I go to course groups, but it's not so much about A Course in Miracles per se. It's about our oneness. It's about enlightenment. So now I'm getting invitations to Conversations with God groups and Power of Now groups and mm. you name it, uh, Advaita Vedanta and on and on. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. And uh, if they, uh, I was up in New England, they had, uh, I forget what they were called, but there's all these groups that I've never even heard of. And they say, would you like to stop by? I say, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> if they had like, uh, Atheist Unite. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, I was in Texas and uh, I was at a Course in Miracles meeting and we went around the room and uh, everyone was introducing themselves and this one guy was like, he said, uh, hello, my name is Arthur and I'm an atheist. Yeah. He said, and I think if there is a God, his name is Arthur. And I think that we're all connected and we're all part of one mind. And I said, hey, Arthur! And Arthur kept showing up, you know, at all the gatherings. And it's like, who cares? Who made these crazy distinctions, believers and non believers? What's the difference? Who's a believer and a non believer? And even Jesus, you know, in the psychotherapy pamphlet, he says, belief in God is unnecessary. For God can be but known. He's wiping out this whole believer, non-believer stuff. You know? uh, and the same thing goes with agnosticism and, and all the, any kind of different path. But in the end, what you realize is it's, it's all your mind. And since you love yourself and you love your Creator, then everyone is included in that love. And you're not going to try to judge against or reject anyone. So to me, I think my path has been one of... Um, you have to have a trust level. You have to trust in, in a power beyond this world, you know, to open up to this. You're not just going to let go of fear and guilt without uh, something to put your faith and trust in. And mm -hmm. 12 steps, you know, higher power or God as we know Him, uh, whether it's uh, Jehovah or whatever. Anybody wants to call it whatever name, it doesn't really matter. It's just this uh, beautiful Creator that is, just loves us so dearly and blesses us beyond anything we can even fathom in this world. But it's nice to receive all those miracles and have them just showering down upon you. So I often share that um, I really don't do sermons. Uh, and I, I just come and I talk, but generally it's like when we come together, we have the spirit. We all have the spirit within us. And so the questions come and the answers come, and we all feel like we're just being showered and blessed in, in God's love. because. Uh, there's no, there's not even any hierarchies. There's no uh, beginner and intermediate, and advanced uh, in oneness. But a God of oneness doesn't see gradations uh, of beginner, intermediate, advanced. And so what I share is that from the state of salvation or enlightenment, you feel in your heart and you see everyone as enlightened with you. It's not this old kind of guru trip of uh, I've got it and you don't. Uh, it's just joy of. We're all in this, and that's where the joy is, because we can, you can feel it. You can feel it in your heart, the connection. And then when the questions come, all it really is is an opportunity for clarity, for getting into some of the subtleties, because the ego can sometimes seem kind of sneaky and sometimes kind of subtle. But when we join together, there is no way that the ego can hide. It's nothingness. <laughs> we can really see it for what it is. And that's why we laugh, and we laugh a lot. And that's why we don't take anything seriously. We don't, whatever seems to arise, you know, it's like we don't buy into it. And, and in that joy and in that laughter and peace, you know, it's pretty obvious that, as we were just saying, in this very room, <laughs> that God is here with us. So I greet you all with great love, and I am so honored that uh, we could all be here tonight to rejoice and celebrate in God's love. And... Uh, we can get into any of the, the subtleties, uh, just the songs we were singing, you know, about uh, God, God divinely providing for us. Um, that's a topic that uh, we've been going into uh, 
a gentleman came to the One Center last night and he really had a lot of questions about this, you know, divine providence and how are you provided for and a lot of doubts and fears and that was so beautiful that he could just pour out his heart and it kind of ignited the whole evening uh, because it was so sincere. And that's what we do when we come together. Uh, if you want to talk about relationships or sickness or death, uh, the mind, um, how do you apply the course principles to specific situations, those are all really good practical things because it's right where your heart is, you know. You don't need another theology to just memorize a bunch of high ideals. <laughs> we want an experience <laughs> of, of openness and an open heart and an intimacy and a connection. And so that's what I call practical spirituality. It's, it's when we come together, the Spirit just orchestrates everything that goes on to bring and just to bless us, to bring clarity and blessing. So I open the floor up. If anybody has anything they want to talk about, we'll dive into it. about sickness, David? Sickness. Well, the ego is and sickness are synonymous. And we might say that what Jesus teaches us is that all illness is mental illness. So right away you can see uh, where it's starting to go. <laughs> because in this world the ego has tried to convince us that uh, there's all kinds of many different sicknesses and many different illnesses and that there are many different forms of it. And you start studying the Course and you get to lessons like 79 and 80, let me recognize the problem, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved, and then let me recognize my, my problems have been solved in 80. So basically what we're looking at is that this is what the mind training is about, is beginning to open your mind to this statement that all illness is mental illness. To begin to train your mind when it's tempted to think that it has, you have a physical pain or a physical ailment, to start to go within and say, okay, this is just symbolic. This is a symptom of a misperception. And we could say that sickness is always a misperception. God's will of pure love has nothing to do with sickness. So, first of all, we're saying sickness, all illness is mental illness. Second thing I'll say is that it's like uh, in Lesson 136, we learn that sickness is a defense against the truth, and that sickness is a decision. So not only is all sickness or illness mental, but it's a decision. So, that really leads to a question I get when I travel a lot of who in their right mind would choose to be sick. And I say, that's it. You have got it. That's it. Who, who in their right mind? That's exactly it. That, and that is a very helpful thing to look at too because then you start to say, then this right mind, wrong mind stuff is pretty important that Jesus is talking about in, in this course. That most of the whole book is coming actually to a discernment, letting the Holy Spirit uh, show you and discern between the right mind and the wrong mind. And if sickness is a wrong-minded decision, uh, it must have some kind of sick, insane attraction, because if you weren't attracted to it, why would you even choose it in the first place? Mm. So it's like they talk about sometimes in 12-step groups about the stinking thinking or the, the attraction to misery. In the Course, he's got some subsections that he has for his chapters, the attraction to guilt, the attraction to pain, the attraction to death. When you first read those titles, it's like, man, is that sick or what? <laughs> What's he talking about in here? But he actually goes in very deeply to saying that, that in this world, you are actually attracted to these things. And that's why we need to expose the ego. Because until the ego is exposed, we could say the wrong mind actually seems attractive or mm -hmm. seems to offer something of value. So that's what we're going to get into tonight when we talk about sickness. Because once we can begin to clearly see that it has no attraction, that is when you are really approaching 
quickly the awakening to the truth. Mm -hmm. Because sickness then holds no attraction. So how does the attraction to guilt work? Well, the ego is the belief that it's possible to separate from God. And then, even though the Holy Spirit is given simultaneously as the answer to that crazy, mad idea, the mind was afraid of the Holy Spirit. And so it made up a world and projected out a hiding place. Uh, some of you know, have heard about in the Bible, there was the Adam and Eve story, and, you know, and then they were naked and they covered themselves with a fig leaf. Well, you might think that this whole cosmo, cosmos of time and space is like a giant fig leaf. <laughs> it's like a giant cosmic fig leaf. A place where God could enter not, it says in the workbook. You know. mm. It actually says the world was made as an attack on God, a place where God could enter not. So this is almost just like a hiding place. Like the ego said, let's make up some stars and some dust. Uh, <laughs> and uh, God's eternal. He'll never chase you uh, into time and space. You can hide in there. He's not going to come in and try and get you in there. You're safe. You're safe in the dust. Mm. And the mind that is afraid of the Holy Spirit actually thinks it's, it can hide, <laughs> and that there's something to hide from. So that's where this body identification stuff comes in, of getting identified with these tiny little vessels of flesh, uh, thinking that this is, uh, is the home now, instead of the kingdom of heaven. So the attraction of guilt comes in uh, from judgment. Um, the cosmos in and of itself is just, once it seemed to be made up by the ego, the Holy Spirit neutralized the whole thing, kind of like a chemistry experiment where you've got this acid going and <laughs> you, put in, you put in the neutralizer. So it's not good and it's not evil. It's not an evil world and it's not a good world. It's just been neutralized by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit sees no guilt with this world. But the ego is going to use this world to promote and to maintain and to perpetuate a sense of guilt. Because if you're guilty, you can't be innocent. And the Course keeps saying, the Holy Spirit is saying, you are innocent. <laughs> and that's not going to change. <laughs> God's not changing his mind. You're going to be forever innocent. So the way it works is, all these images get fragmented out. And, and that's no problem right there. The Holy Spirit heals, neutralizes the whole thing, and sees this beautiful tapestry of time and space. And the ego tries to break the pieces off into little tiny pieces and fragments. And then it arranges them in hierarchies of illusions. Uh, good images, bad images, or indifferent images. <laughs> so you might say that judgment is an attempt to arrange the fragments. Mm -hmm. And these go by different names. You could call them a hierarchy of illusions. You could call them preferences. When we talk about food preferences, clothing preferences, environmental preferences, sexual preferences, temperature preferences, you know, to have preferences, you've got to have a range. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the ego's plan is for maintaining guilt. You know, because if you've got good, good illusions and bad illusions, you're not seeing them as the same. Mm -hmm. The good ones would be what? More attractive. Mm -hmm. And the bad ones would be more repulsive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as long as the ego can maintain this game of ranking ranking the images, the hierarchies, and whatever, uh, compare it even. That's, you know, the Course says, comparison must be an ego device, for love makes them. Mm -hmm. As long as the mind is caught up into comparing and ranking and saying, this is good, this is better, and this is the best, and this is my favorite, and, you know, the typical things, then the ego is just sitting back there like a little spider going, ha, 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 ha. I got you, I have fooled you into thinking that the images are real. And, and the mind feels depressed, and it feels upset, and angry, and guilty. So, that's why this is A Course in Miracles, where every little miracle that you have, every little tweak of, of your mind, where you just, uh, I say, see the false as false. You look around you, and you go, hmm. Just feel the Lord thy God in your heart, and you can look and let those eyes move across all those images. That's what the mind training of that workbook's about. You know, nothing I see is anything. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. I do not understand what anything is for. <laughs> if you start to see those workbook lessons, he's going to take you inward to a place of non-judgment, to this calm, still point with the Holy Spirit. 
where you can just look upon the false as false. Thank you very much. <laughs> don't need to dissect it. Don't need to arrange it into hierarchies. Don't need to get into all these schemes. In fact, he defines a miracle. He says a miracle does not create or really change at all. It merely looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. You see how we're looking at just being able to sink in there with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus, and to just see the false is false. Now, the ego does not like this miracle stuff, because <laughs> it, this is the undoing of the ego. And if the, if the miracles keep getting stronger and stronger and more consistent into awareness, it's kind of like uh, the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. Ah, I'm milking, I'm milking. <laughs> a little bit of water will do the trick. Uh, a little bit of Holy Spirit and miracles, and this witch has no power. I mean, it just you just down to a cap and gown in a hurry. Because the miracle just completely dissolves away this guilt and this uh, pain and suffering. Yeah. yeah. And we go, yay to that. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs>